Great. Well, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today on this important topic. In particular, I thank my colleague, Dr. Sergui, for his friendship and encouragement to address the theme of philanthropy and global health crises. My own qualifications for this task may appear surprising. I'm an historian of medieval and Renaissance Europe, and my research has centered on humanism and the humanities. Yet one of the humanist writers I've studied is Giovanni Boccaccio, who wrote a famous account of the outbreak of the second plague pandemic, also known as the Black Death, in Florence in 1348. And last April, Ara hosted a conversation with me on the course and curse of pandemics throughout history. At Guilford College, I've had the pleasure of participating as faculty representative on the Philanthropic Council of the Board of Trustees. Through this participation, I have come to appreciate what Ara has called the art and science of philanthropy. My respect for what you do is enormous, and my study for this talk today has only deepened this respect. To the art and science of philanthropy, I'm grateful to add the craft of history. History is the medium or context in which philanthropy operates. On almost all the websites of the 36 institutions of NCICU, uh, 34 of them at least by my reckoning, students, parents, and donors can find the history of the institution. A number of these historical accounts is exempl uh, are exemplary, among them Gardner Webb, Johnson C. Smith, and Lenore Rhine, to mention only three. And in all the accounts, one can see how philanthropy has played a vital role in the founding and growth of the mission in higher education. I would like to discuss with you today the relation between history and philanthropy in view of global health crises, how history has changed philanthropy and how philanthropy has changed history. As I said, I approach this subject with a sense of my own limited qualifications and my contribution, oh, pardon me, lost my slides. And my contribution will be far less without the collaboration of a number of colleagues at Guilford Duke and SMU. Before I begin, I must also say how this talk has made me more aware of philanthropy in my own life. In fact, if we would consider it carefully, each of us, I believe, can see the helpful hand of philanthropy at some moment or two or three in our lives. So I signal here a story at the outset. In March 2004, my nephew and godchild, Keenan King, was born premature with underdeveloped lungs. He needed care in the neonatal unit at the Women's Hospital in Greensboro. He quickly developed pneumonia and was listed in critical condition. He required surfactant, a substance that helps lungs contract and expand. After receiving the surfactant, he recovered quickly. The March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation is the leading philanthropic organization funding the biomedical research into treating infants with this condition. And the following year, Keenan was featured at the charity auction for the March of Dimes in Greensboro. Today, he is a junior at Williams High School in Burlington and the point guard on their basketball team. This story is but one example of the way philanthropy changes history at critical moments in our lives. The March of Dimes itself was born in a global health crisis, the crisis of polio. It began as the National Foundation for Infant Paralysis in 1938 through the philanthropy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and raised money for the clinical trials of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. In 1960, it helped fund the foundation of the Salk Institute of Biological Sciences, which continues to lead advances in biomedicine today. As some of you may recall, the March of Dimes was literally that, children donating dimes during the Christmas fundraising season. And in 1946, Roosevelt's profile was featured on the coin. This speaks to a theme I would emphasize today, philanthropy's exponential effect, the way it galvanizes donors great and small from all walks of life. It both requires and fosters a deeper sense of community and commitment, 
And from this sense, it leads to larger, sometimes unforeseen benefits, not least in the realm of higher education. For that reason, philanthropy is never more important than it is today when people and institutions suffer great need and feel isolated from one another. In turn, to be effective, philanthropy must continually account for the history and the cultural context of those in need. The three examples I will discuss today cover six centuries and three continents. In their differences, they highlight the ongoing transformations of philanthropy according to time and place. By so doing, they also underscore common lessons for us today. How health crises call upon philanthropic giving. How education is critical for philanthropic success and how education itself is transformed through philanthropy to address problems in new ways. Healthcare, philanthropy, and education, in other words, form a dynamic interdependent relationship to their mutual benefit. We turn to our first example, the Hotel Dieu de Bonne. The Hotel Dieu began as a charitable foundation, as a hospital for the indigent and less fortunate, and has grown to provide an array of medical services. Its location, Bonn, lies in the heart of the region of Burgundy in eastern France. In the 15th century, Burgundy operated as a nearly independent duchy with respect to the French kings. The Dukes of Burgundy at the time, such as John the Fearless and Philip the Good, often played kingmaker as the French royal house suffered reversals and divisions during the ongoing conflict with England known as the Hundred Years' War. This conflict, which lasted from 1336 to 1453, created great hardship in Burgundy. Bands of roving mercenaries pillaged the countryside, seizing goods and destroying granaries and wine presses for their metal. In addition to the chaos, the bubonic plague continued to strike with repeated ferocity. The, this plague, also known as the Black Death, first spread throughout Europe in the mid 14th century, as I've mentioned, but it returned every number of years to take more victims and would continue to do so into the 18th century. A survey taken in the area of Bone around 1443 reported that of 470 households, 90% were suffering extreme poverty. The population had declined over 20% since 1400. In more stable times, the agricultural land was fertile and the wine harvest renowned, but years of hunger, poverty, disease, and war, the veritable four horsemen of the apocalypse, had created a severe crisis. In the face of this crisis, the Chancellor of Burgundy, Nicolas Rolland, and his wife, Guigon de Salin, and you can see them on alternate sides of the panel here uh, from the painting of Roger van der Weyden, they decided to found a new hospital for the poor and sick at Bonn, the Hotel Dieu. Roland was a lawyer of bourgeois or middle-class origins and he gained the confidence of the Burgundian Dukes. Originally from nearby Autun, he lived for a time in Paris directly opposite that city's Hotel Dieu. And this hospital in Paris inspired his design for the establishment at Bonn. Guigon was his third wife. She came from <clears throat> the higher nobility. Her family was known for its charitable work as her father, Etienne de Salin, had founded the hospital of Saint-Jacques in Ivray. We can make reasonable inferences about their motives for philanthropy. They witnessed the value of other charitable foundations. They saw the plight of the local inhabitants during this crisis, and they themselves suffered personal losses at this time. Nicholas' son died after captivity as a prisoner of war. Higon's mother and three other close relatives succumbed to the plague in 1440. We also have their personal testimony. Like many people of their time, they looked to the religion for spiritual and moral guidance. And you've been looking at now the interior of this panel. That was the exterior I showed you initially with their, with their images, but this is the interior of this altarpiece, which is still in the hospital chapel at Bonn. In his charter for the Hôtel Dieu, the founding charter, Nicholas begins by expressing the desire, he writes, to exchange my temporal goods, which have been enriched by divine blessing for celestial ones, 
and to let go of transitory things in order to enjoy eternal goods. The founding charter states his motivation to find spiritual benefit for acts of charity. The hospital itself was a religious foundation, sanctioned and supported by the papacy, and run by a religious order of nurses who were young and married women between the ages of 18 and 30. Nicola began, uh, composed his charter in 1443, and by 1452, the hospital was admitting its first patients. As a clever financier, Roland arranged for the funding to come from various sources. The purchase of indulgences, the remission from time in purgatory, uh, from pur in purgatory that the popes arranged in other places of pilgrimage. Also, income from salt mines, which Nicola and Gigon controlled, and not least from the sale of wine from nearby vineyards. Bone itself was situated in the center of rich wine country, and the city hosted an important seat of justice, the regional parliament for the duchy, which ensured that the hospital would gain renown, as well as its benefactors. These sources of support provided, first of all, that the hospital would have the financial means independent from local nobility and clergy, and secondly, that these funds, as an endowment, would allow the hospital to continue its mission in succeeding generations. And in fact, uh, on the third Sunday of November, every year, there's a major wine auction in Bonn uh, for the sale of wine, which goes to support these ongoing uh, medical services in the region. The visitors receive care from a special order of nurses, the, sister, the Sisters of St. Martha, an order that Nicola and Guigon devised with the support of the church. These nurses were lay, unmarried women. They took vows of pious service that were simple, temporary, and revocable. And they, and they were released from these vows when they decided to leave, much like the beginning orders of the time. Here we have an example of the main ward of the, of the hospital where the nurses worked. And here's an example of how they would have worked. This is uh, not the Sisters at Bonn, but the Sisters in Notre Dame in Paris, which was the model for, for them at Bonn. So here's an uh, illustration from 1482. You can see the patients and the nurses serving the patients. The sisters spread their administrative services to other hospitals, and the last sister at Bonn retired in 2006. In the course of the years, the original foundation expanded to include an orphanage, visiting medical care to the surrounding villages, and eventually a retirement home. This first example shows us how philanthropic skill and vision could produce a charitable establishment over many generations. The philanthropic motives were complex, spiritual intent, desire for social status, and the need to create a lasting legacy. To establish the hospital required astute teamwork between the married couple and also with political and religious authorities. It drew upon precedent, yet was tailored to the urgent needs of the times and fashioned on the customs of Burgundy and more generally, Papal Europe. Its endowment grounded itself on the regional economy, the salt mines and vineyards, so that it had sources for support in perpetuity. We will see similar philanthropic strategies in our next more recent examples. One point that bears repeating is how philanthropy responds to health crises in a multidimensional way, combining abilities and expertise from various actors to solve complex and dynamic problems. We now turn to our second example closer to home, the influenza pandemic of 1918 and its effect on North Carolina colleges. On a global scale, the pandemic was responsible for at least 50 million deaths, and it was therefore, it's been considered the most lethal in recorded history. Over 25% of Americans were likely infected and nearly 700,000 died from it. The death toll was particularly staggering, not only in Asia and Africa, but also in American cities like Philadelphia, where almost 10% of the population died in the fall of 1918. This was the second wave of the pandemic, more deadly than the first. And it was unusual in that it was most severe in young adults who were normally more resistant to disease. Third and fourth waves would come in the following years. 
The authorities responded with measures familiar to us today, business closures, quarantines, mandated mask wearing. And then as now, these measures met with resistance and skepticism, despite the efforts of health authorities to encourage them. And here's a report you can see from uh, the journal Science of May 1919, talking about the lessons from the pandemic. The need for palliative care was made more acute by the wartime period with resources and personnel stretched thin overseas. In North Carolina, the influenza, influenza was responsible for around 13,000 deaths by 1919 in a state with a population of about 2.5 million. By comparison, COVID-19 today has claimed the lives of about 7,000 North Carolinians out of 10.5 million inhabitants. The strain on public health services in the early 20th century, such as they existed, were enormous. And here you see a telegram from the uh, Secretary of the State Department of Health, Watson Rankin, to the U.S. Public Health Service, talking about Kannapolis in Cabarrus County. Of course, that's now the, the, the home for the Cabarrus College of um, Health Sciences. He says out of six or 7,000 people in the county, 2,000 people had the flu or the influenza, and they had a total of three doctors in the county. And he's asking doctors about exhausted. I think that says it all. Authorities urge people to avoid public gatherings, and indeed, they ban them. And they imposed a quarantine for those infected. <clears throat> Not only doctors, but especially nurses were in short supply. And the Red Cross helped set up temporary hospitals and organize local relief efforts. Naturally, the influenza had a tremendous effect on North Carolina colleges and universities. Two presidents of the University of North Carolina died of the disease, Edward Kitter Graham and Marvin Hendrick Stacy. Both men were in their early 40s. The outbreak brought about the appointment of the first university physician. Guilford College had a student enrollment at the time of 170, and of these, 70 students contracted the flu, a rate of over 40%. And by comparison, there's just one comparison at Bryn Mawr College outside Philadelphia, another Quaker institution, about 24% of students contracted the disease. The college instituted quarantine periods when day students were required to remain on campus and ill students were isolated in Hagee Cox Hall. And here you can see entrance cards for one of these students. And on the back, this is on the left-hand side, you can make out the writing there, quarantined October 7th. So that was the period when she was quarantined. The student's care was managed by a local doctor and particularly by the school nurse, Laura Worth. Worth had graduated from Guilford in 1892 and was the, er, was the nurse from 1905 to 1928. The administration organized diversions and picnics for students and the student newspaper printed this bit of comic verse. Where are you taking all those plates, inquired the curious red, to feed the flues, to feed the flues, Joe Taylor sadly said. They eat cod liver oil frappe with sauce of Listerine and for dessert a little bowl of glycothymoline. We're serving to you more today one seventh of a bean. He says he'll starve to death before the morning. Now, some of you may be wondering what glycothymoline is, and I was too, and so it is a mouthwash. <laughs> that you can still purchase today under the name of Glyco. So obviously the health authorities at the time thought that mouthwash like Listerine and Glyco were really important for taking care of people with the disease. And despite Hugh Moore's fears, no students, remarkably, succumbed to the disease, to the influenza. And this speaks to the care and discipline of the staff and students at the college. In, discuss in discussing philanthropic reactions to the influenza, influenza crisis, we can look to responses statewide and also more locally here at Guilford. We have already seen the engagement of the Red Cross in helping the sick. The Secretary of the State Board of Health, Watson Rankin, whom I mentioned a few minutes ago, succeeded in persuading James Buchanan Duke in subsidizing the construction of nonprofit hospitals through a portion of the Duke Endowment which he established in 1924. The endowment provided modern hospital care 
to rural North Carolina and supported orphanages throughout the state. The endowment also was a major benefactor in North Carolina education, funding not only the new Duke University, formerly Trinity College, but also granting monies to Davidson College and Johnson C. Smith University, among others. The Duke family played a, made a critical philanthropic role at Guilford College, as we shall see. 1918 was a crucial year in the history of the college. The trustees had appointed Raymond Binford as president, a post he would keep until 1934. The college had begun a capital campaign in May of 1918 to raise $200,000 and would liquidate its debt of six, that which would liquidate its debt of $61,000 and provide for future growth. Yet the influenza interrupted the campaign and despite efforts among trustees, faculty and students and Quakers nationwide, it failed to meet its goal. Binford changed the fundraising strategy, creating a Guilford Sustaining Club to bridge annual expenses until a new campaign could be launched. In the fall of 1922, the new campaign began with the ambitious goal of $300,000. Binford recruited the aid of Elwood Parishow, who taught at Guilford in the 1890s. And I put this on the record because this is a remarkable fact that I've read in um, Dorothy Gilbert's History of the College. Parishow gave 335 speeches for the college in 1922 in one year, and averaged about 200 speeches a year through 1927. He organized a series of Guilford College clubs throughout Guilford County. When the campaign closed in June 1924, it had reached its goal. Among the benefactors were the networks of Quakers, the citizens of Guilford County, and the students too, who had pledged $8,000. Two former students made massive contributions, James Duke, along with his brother Benjamin, had studied there in the 1870s and each gave $25,000. And in addition, Benjamin gave 500 shares of Duke Power stock, valued at the time at over $62,000. The responses to the health crisis of the 1918 influenza created long lasting changes in North Carolina and at Guilford. The state became more active and responsive to providing medical care for its citizens. This medical care included greater numbers of nurses who proved their merit as frontline workers, not least at Guilford College. Philanthropists came to the fore from all corners, local citizens, college students, and those who, as in Bonn, shared a common spiritual or religious vision. Though I have spoken about Guilford College, it would be interesting to see how other institutions in the NCICU reacted to the pandemic and what changes it produced in administration, philanthropy, and curriculum. As for James, James Duke's endowment and given, he was certainly concerned about the poor condition of healthcare and the need to support education. And it may be he was inspired by Andrew Carnegie's vision, the gospel, gospel of wealth, which Carnegie articulated in 1889. Carnegie had decided in midlife to limit his personal wealth and donate monies to causes that supported the greater good. He became, in people's words, a radical philanthropist, and many others followed suit, including James Duke's daughter's daughter Doris, who devoted her wealth to charitable causes, many of them in the medical field. The Duke Endowment, of course, is still very active in philanthropy today funding not only college and university programs, but also childcare and family well-being and church outreach projects. It recently surpassed a total of $4 billion in grants distributed, including $156 million in 2019, 64 million of which went to higher education. In the examples from 15th century Burgundy and 20, early 20th century North Carolina, we have seen philanthropists work within existing institutions to create new avenues of care and well being. A hospital system at Bonn, rural hospitals, and revived college education in our state. The example of philanthropic response to influenza shows, in particular, how entire communities and a wide range of stakeholders become engaged alumni, county citizens, and students. 
In our final example today, that of health crises in contemporary Africa, we will see another phase of philanthropic endeavor based upon what is sometimes called scientific philanthropy. That is, an applied science derived from sociology and other social sciences aimed at addressing social problems, especially those of the truly needy. And as such, it speaks to the conversations you've been holding today about diversity, equity, and inclusion. The need of people in Africa in the face of global health crises is truly great. I summarize here only four current challenges. HPV or cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in sub-Saharan Africa. And infection by HPV is the main reason for the high incidence of this cancer. In one study conducted between 2015 and 2017, 42% of women under 30 in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, were found to have a strain of HPV. In South Africa, as of 2019, five and a half thousand women die each year of cervical cancer, although the HPV vaccine was introduced in 2014. Malaria, as you can see, in 2017, according to the WHO, there were 200 million cases in Africa. HIV AIDS, in 2018, over 26 million people infected with over 1 million new infections that year. TB, 2.5 million cases in 2016, with 417,000 deaths. In response to these crises, multilateral organizations have driven vaccination programs throughout the continent and indeed on a global scale. And I'm mentioning here three of the most prominent. <clears throat> the first is Gavi. <clears throat> Established in 1999, Gavi is a vaccine alliance that has supported the distribution of vaccines throughout the continent. It brings together a partnership and business model that employs an economy of scale in order to reduce the cost of vaccines and secure their continued use in afflicted countries. It has distributed millions of vaccines against HPV and other diseases such as meningitis and cholera. Second I mentioned is the Global Fund. Begun in 2002, the Global Fund is another partnership of donor agencies and organizations it looks not at diseases individually, but rather at the interplay among them, particularly malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. Tuberculosis is far more lethal to people infected with HIV or suffering otherwise from weakened immune systems. So the Global Fund provides vaccines and health services that have reduced malaria deaths by as much as 50% and provided antiretroviral therapies to millions of those with HIV. Both Gavi and the Global Fund create multilateral technocratic responses to these health crises. They show, as we have seen in our examples, how effective philanthropy brings together different groups in a common cause. The Global Fund also recognizes that diseases occur in context and relation to one another, and that focusing on one health emergency such as TB without considering contributing crises is less effective than examining how diseases influence and exacerbate each other. The last organization I'll present to you today is Partners in Health. Partners in Health is an example of how other philanthropic efforts in Africa and elsewhere have emphasized a less top-down technocratic or business approach to philanthropy. It was founded in 1987, excuse me, with the aim of providing more direct structural changes in healthcare and in recent decades, it has gathered resources to train community health workers in rural areas. Those who by clinical experience know best how to deliver health services to local people living in impoverished conditions. The organization therefore responds to the needs of the local community, the needs of both healthcare workers and the people they serve. In a real sense, Partners in Health builds upon the philanthropic efforts of Gavi and the Global Fund. If these two stress the critical cooperation between the healthcare and business sectors, Partners in Health emphasizes a third sector, one that we discussed with the influenza epidemic and dear to our own mission, education with an aim to equity, the subject you have been discussing this afternoon. These organizations understand, as did earlier philanthropists, that a global health crisis is a problem to be solved by a team of stakeholders. If scientists develop a vaccine, 
and a business plan that makes it affordable it depends on the training of the healthcare workers to understand the best means of reaching people on the ground and persuading them to take it. Their training therefore relies not only within the fields of science, technology, and business. It also depends upon knowledge from the humanities and social sciences, knowledge of history, religion, culture, political relations, and so forth. To that end, in 2015, Partners in Health, with the support of the Cummings Foundation and the Gates Foundation, created the University of Global Health Equity in rural Rwanda. Among the degrees offered is a Master of Science in Global Health Delivery, a program that, in its own words, focuses, quote, on systems rather than symptoms, with the aim of grasping the larger picture of healthcare that embraces the whole person in his or her environment. I would like to end where I began, in emphasizing the ways these historical examples show how healthcare, education, and philanthropy form a dynamic, interdependent relationship to their mutual benefit. In our time, this interdependency has never been stronger or more vital. Scholars from different disciplines, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, philosophy, history, linguistics, sociology, have come together to address global health crises with the support of philanthropy. During this crisis of COVID-19, NCICU institutions have raised money for emergency funds for students, faculty and administration have collaborated with philanthropic help in creating safe and secure learning environments both on campus and remotely through distance learning. Scientists and scholars have been philanthropists as well. Jonas Salk never patented his polio vaccine nor made money from it, for he wanted it to be as widely distributed as possible. Salk too was a visionary in terms of seeing the collaboration among scholars and educators from various disciplines. In a 1966 article in the New York Times, Howard Taubman describes Salk's mission in words we can now appreciate in light of the history of philanthropy we've just followed. As a biologist, Taubman writes, Salk believes that his science is on the frontier of tremendous new discoveries, and as a philosopher, he is convinced that humanists and artists have joined the scientists to achieve an understanding of man and all his physical, mental, and spiritual complexity. Such interchanges might lead, he would hope, to a new and important school of thinkers he would designate as bio-philosophers. Dr. Salk, a creative man himself, hopes that the Institute will do its share in probing the wisdom of nature, and thus enlarge the wisdom of man for the ultimate purpose of science, humanism, and the arts, in his judgment, is the freeing of each individual to cultivate his full creativity in whichever direction it leads. Salk's vision reached back to the traditions of ancient Greece, of open dialogue and exchange for the purposes of human betterment. Philanthropy, of course, is a Greek word found in the ancient dramatists and the dialogues of Plato. In terms of the Judeo-Christian traditions of many institutions of NCICU, it is also an important term in the Greek scriptures, for example, in the New Testament. And its occurrence there, I think, takes us to the root of your enterprise, its origin and fulfillment. The word philanthropia has the meaning of kindness, care, love, and goodwill. According to the act, the author of the Acts of the Apostles, the inhabitants on Malta, uncultured as they were, showed a concern and care for us, which was quite out of the ordinary. And St. Paul in his letter to Titus writes, however, the time came for God our Savior to let his kindness and his love for mankind dawn upon the world. The Latin word for this kindness and love, philanthropia, is humanitas. Humanitas reminds us that philanthropy is a core element of our humanity. As we pursue philanthropy, we become more fully human and more whole. Can there be a higher calling than this? I wish you all the best in your endeavors, knowing that you lead the member institutions of the NCICU to fulfilling their mission in making our world healthier and more humane. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you.
Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Karcher. This is Colleen Kinzer with NCICU. I really appreciate you taking your time to um, come to us today and share that interesting perspective on, on philanthropy and the global health crisis. It's uh, a very relevant topic these days as we're navigating some new experiences in our field. So um, thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, we are ending a little bit early. Um, so it, I did want to see if anybody had any questions for Dr. Kircher before I, I let him go. I, I'm monitoring the, the chat, so I'm just making sure. Um, oh, we just we have a lot of people saying thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, appreciate that. Uh, feel free to join us tomorrow. We are going to kick off tomorrow at nine o'clock. Uh, we are going to have our breakout sessions tomorrow. Um, we will start with our senior leaders, alumni relations, and major gift officers will have a, a session at nine o'clock tomorrow. And then at 10 o'clock tomorrow, we will have annual giving, plan giving, and another session for our major gift officers. Uh, we have pre-assigned um, breakout rooms for each of you that have uh, specified your preferences. But if you're looking over the agenda and you see something else that just um, sparks your interest, feel free to uh, choose another session or go wherever you find um, it's going to be the most beneficial for you. Uh, thank you, Betsy, for, for being our, our host on this Zoom call. And thank you all for attending. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Thanks so much and have a great night.